whips it gets whipped up uh, when the wind blows and uh, sometimes it's two three feet high uh, the mud people cover themselves in the mud and that's a picture of down now can you guys see my my arrow when I'm moving it around anybody I don't okay, I don't think it's right yeah I oh see okay Okay, I don't so they see don't it, see it. Yeah. Oh, you do see it. All right. So anyway, that's an old picture, probably the 1950s of uh, the downtown. We're a tourist town. These are all the different tourist events uh, that we have. When I took office, there were eight. Uh, and then last year, we had over 20 events. So we're really ramping up our tourism. And uh, the big challenge, though, for our little town is we've had a declining population for decades. Uh, we've got deteriorating infrastructure, a poor economy, uh, and our population is, is quite a bit lower than it was at its peak in 1955. So what we have going on is a revival, and I'm going to cover some of the recent accomplishments uh, focusing on the walk uh, and, and physical activity aspects of our uh, city uh, remakeover, uh, what, it, what it took, what it's taking, and we are getting noticed. And what momentum means and how to get it. And of course, the last thing is the secret sauce. We all want to know what that is. Some of the key accomplishments, we received over four and a half million dollars. This would be again in the last five years. We completed our downtown renovation after updating the 2005 uh, downtown master plan. We also updated, that led to the updating of a 15 year old park and recreation plan. And some things that are going on that the community is, is re reacting to these developments. Uh, we took over 24 tons of trash out of the city through some community makeover, uh, free trash pickup days, putting big dumpsters in the middle of the city that anybody could dump anything they wanted to. Most significant, I believe, is in 2016, uh, middle of the year, uh, I sold to a single investor our two major hotels, over 45 rooms, and a restaurant for three and a half million dollars. You don't get that kind of investor coming into your a little town like ours unless they see things happening and they have a high level of confidence that they can make money. So uh, the new downtown, this is what it took. Uh, we took planning, collaboration. We had Washington State University. This is the Rural Community Designs Initiative team that came from WSU. They organized the charrettes uh, that brought the community together, educated them on what a downtown uh, might look like redesigning and, and pretty pictures and it was it was quite a process that they took the community through of course our own engineers developed the downtown uh, design plan there from all of the input uh, the health district had uh, had quite a bit of input and we also had funding from the uh, economic development council and TIB stands for transportation improvement board that's a state funding agency the first thing I did was create a downtown steering committee uh, that would uh, that was made up of some citizens that had to lead the charge of executing our downtown revitalization. We formed several subcommittees after that uh, to fill in the work that they need. So we're going to look at this a little bit more. Uh, is this going on right May? So the downtown development was two two point four million dollars. Uh, we had several streets, new sidewalks. We had to replace some sewer lines. And that's a lot of money for our little town. Um, complete streets we passed that ordinance in 2013 uh, and everything that's being done to date is around safe transport for all modes of transportation we've got new landscaping bike racks we've got uh, we're the second city to have LED lights in Grant County and we also restriped a highway I'll show you that that included dedicated bike lanes in both directions this is our main street right here this dark area and this is the highway over on the right hand side that says Daisy that's actually highway 17 we put bulb outs on that highway for safer pedestrian crossing we narrowed this if you look closely this is an old picture shows four lanes uh, two in each direction that's been reduced to one lane in each direction with dedicated left-hand turn lane and dedicated bike lane we also put uh, safety island up here uh, this has been a dangerous corner this is a library this is an alternative school and so we have a pedestrian median you'll also see there's cross at the mid crop mid block crosswalk say that fast ten times you've got <laughs> you've got uh, the the bulb outs as well as the bulb outs at the intersections we put in bike racks we did some fun fundraising from some uh, local foundation and private donor we put over 20 bike racks all around the community you can see the placement there that we had for those 
So a little bit of before, that, that's a very recent picture of our downtown, probably about 2014. That's the Inn at Soap Lake and the Notaris Lodge that I mentioned earlier. And now we see what our new downtown. You'll notice we took it from a straight raceway uh, to putting a little bit of curve into it to slow the traffic down. You can see the nice bulb outs there. You can see where we put new landscaping in. There's some bike racks right there. And of course, our beautiful LED lighting. This is some of the historic pictures of our community uh, that show uh, before and after. That's the before, that's our community theater, and now what it looks like afterwards. This is the construction that took over seven months. And the bottom line is the community knows what it's capable of because when you tear everything up, boy, do you hear about it. And then we celebrated. Everything I read says have a big celebration after you have a win. And so we had our dedication celebration. There I am uh, telling everybody what a great time. And this is one of our state representatives that showed up. We had a great turnout. We had actual dancing in the streets. And then the finishing touches. We're putting in benches, more landscaping. Uh, businesses are making improvements in their own properties. That's a private property development there right on the main inner corner. Uh, we are getting noticed. We're the winner for the Walkable Washington Innovation Award. This was given to three cities in the state of Washington. We were the smallest. Uh, this was out of 65 case studies, and uh, we're also getting noticed by the Transportation Improvement Board. This is a, an agenda that they presented to the state legislators for additional funding. Uh, the newspapers talk about some great things. Here, this has all led, the downtown led to people wanting to get more involved in our parks, and this is the planning process that we went through, uh, create the committee, do the survey, uh, design and then identify the funding sources. This is Grant County Health District. They did a survey that was put out in three languages. And first, we had a workshop to develop the survey questions. 192 surveys were filled out. They said that was an excellent sampling for such a small community. We had two follow-up workshops after the survey to feed that information back, refine the input from the community, and we created the downtown uh, we created the uh, updated park plan that included a walk plan. You can see more details there. We also uh, has led to a $1.3 million grant that we've applied for. We're number six in the state in line to get that, and that's for this red line to connect our two main beaches. So you see some more, more design work there. Citizens, that's what it takes, is all the citizens getting together, and uh, the secret sauce, when you find a citizen, when you're as a leader, and they're talking, you're talking about an idea you've got, or you're listening to an idea that they're passionate about, when they are passionate, you put your arm around them and say, you sound like a perfect candidate to talk to other people about this. You don't say put them in charge because that scares them and they run. You want to just kind of come alongside and say, hey, I've got some other people that I think are going to be interested in the same thing you are. Let's get together for a meeting, you know, and organize a lunch or something, sit them down, talk, find the common areas. Next thing you go, you've got a committee, you take it before the council, get it approved, and boom, things start happening. These are all volunteers from our fire department to our police department uh, and, the, and the community. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Raymond, thank you so much. I am using the technical part where I've asked for patience for a moment to switch over to Angela Trent, our next presenter. And Angela is going to make sure that she's got her screen showing here before we can uh, proceed. So Angela, I think it's with you now. And I'm seeing Sergeant Bluff, Iowa, in the picture. And go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you, Pam, and the National Physical Activity Society for inviting me to talk about uh, what we have accomplished in Sergeant Bluff. Sergeant Bluff is located, like Pam had said earlier, just south of Sioux City, and we are on the western side of Iowa. You can get in about three states in about 10 to 15 minutes traveling time because um, we border Nebraska and South Dakota. Sergeant Bluff has approximately 4,300 residents and there are about 1,500 students in the Sergeant Bluff Luton Community School District. We started in the fall of 2014. Uh, the health department, which is who I work for, received a federal Partnerships to Improve uh, Community Health Grant, which we call PITCH. 
it took a while, you know, anytime you're working with a federal grant, it takes a while to get your work plan approved. So it wasn't until January of 2015 that we were able to reach out to the city of Sergeant Bluff and Sergeant Bluff Luton Community School Districts in hopes that we'd be able to partner with them to work on increasing access to physical activity opportunities, really focusing on policy system and environmental changes through the development of safe routes to school programs and complete streets initiatives. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we got started today and what we've been able to accomplish and we'll briefly talk about what the next steps are. So what we do uh, did to get started was really looked at who can we get around the table that's enthusiastic about the topic. Um, so we obviously formed our community coalition. Some of the individuals that we were able to get around the table included our elementary school principal, our parks and rec director, public works director, of course the city administrator, um, uh, city council member, we had involved our transportation planner from our local metropolitan planning organization, a representative from our Woodbury County Safe Kids program, and of course myself. What we did is in order to try to, to move the pendulum and, and make some changes, we really decided to focus more on the safe routes to school aspect of it and then be able to move into the Complete Streets initiatives. So what we did is really focused on the six E's of the Safe Routes to School program to get started. And today I'm only going to be sharing what we've accomplished uh, with evaluation and engineering, although we've done a lot uh, on the, the ends of education, encouragement, and enforcement as well. The first thing that we did once we had our coalition together was sent out an electronic survey to parents to assess walking and biking habits and issues that affect their choices to allow their children to walk or bike to school in Sergeant Bluff. We then analyzed the neighborhoods and existing sidewalks, where they were, where they weren't, and then the current patterns of walking, and we were able to identify some safer routes from each of the neighborhoods to the schools. And you can see that map there on the right-hand side of the slide. From there, what we did is completed walkability audits using a tool called a WABSA. Um, it's a tool that was developed by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill that assesses a variety of different um, infrastructure related to walkability. And then we took photos, which I would highly recommend if anybody's going to be doing this, is to take photos when you do those walkability audits because they come in really handy um, for some of the next steps. So we analyzed all of that data and were able to summarize the results. And when we looked at summarizing the results, we really wanted to say, okay, here, here's what we have what do we want to do with it? So we looked at developing kind of a, a priority list. Our coalition uh, developed some recommendations for improvements along those routes that scored poorly on the WABSA. And then we shared the results and recommendations with our city council and with the school district administration. We prioritized some of the areas in one particular neighborhood, and it was this particular neighborhood that scored um, a, a little worse than some of the other neighborhoods in Sergeant Bluff. So you can see um, on the picture there, the priority number one that we have identified down here, this was um, an intersection where there was no sidewalk on the south side of the street. And let me see, you can point that out right here. Um, they had to cross, so all of the traffic and the residents that lived down here, including the students, had to cross this uh, high traffic, high volume, high speed road, making it difficult for them to do that because it was only a two-way stop. And then they'd have to walk along this sidewalk here. Um, so we wanted to be able to make this intersection a little safer for pedestrians. The number two route, which is right here, there is a park in this area, um, and there's a new subdivision that's going in over here. And so we really wanted to be able to connect the park and the residents that lived up here and provide a safer route for them to walk down as well. And then number three, this section here is just a, it's an area where it's rental property, and so the sidewalk condition was pretty poor in, in relation to other areas of the community. So this is a document 
that we revisit regularly as a coalition and it really provides guidance for our next steps. It also showed the city council that we needed funding for some of the sidewalk improvements and that helped with um, proving and being able to secure some additional funding for some of the projects that we were able to do. So I mentioned earlier our pitch grant. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, our grant really did not allow us to use any of the funding for infrastructure improvements. It was really only for staff time and mileage for my time for coordination of the coalition meetings and some of the projects. So we had to seek out additional funding to be able to make some of those infrastructure improvements. Fortunately, uh, the city of Sergeant Bluff had come through. They dedicated uh, 10 grand for fiscal year 15, 16, and then an additional 15,000 in fiscal year 16, 17 for just sidewalk improvements. They had previously spent approximately $200,000 on making sidewalk improvements uh, and trails and, and doing connections. So prior to our project, uh, several years ago, they had already demonstrated the interest and the need to make their community more walkable. The school district then kind of came through and as we presented the results of the walkability audits to them, they said that they would go ahead and agree to make improvements on their properties. Um, and then we also were able to secure some funding through a local nonprofit service organization, what they call CAT or the Community Action Team. They have allowed our coalition um, to provide about $500 worth of incentives or uh, educational, be able to pay for like speakers for education um, and to improve the walkability uh, safety for the students of the school. And then one of the, the unique partnerships that came out from our project and kind of presenting the results was a partnership between a local church, a contractor, and a concrete company who um, really work together to improve one section of a residential sidewalk for a homeowner and I'll show you some of those pictures um, here in a little bit. The next slides I'm just going to show you some pictures of the improvements that we made. This here was the intersection on priority one which I had showed you on that map earlier. We were able to convert it from a two-way to a four-way intersection. The flashing LED stop sign was added along with this pedestrian crossing sign. And then we were able to uh, paint some continental crosswalks there and we moved this stop sign. Previously it had been on the street sign which didn't, it made it difficult and unsafe for pedestrians to cross because they were crossing in between cars. So we bumped, which was an easy fix, we bumped the sidewalk or the, we bumped the stop sign back behind the sidewalk so pedestrians would cross the street in front of the vehicles rather than between them. The next slide here you're looking at, we're just one corner along that priority two area that I had showed you earlier. Uh, we added new curb ramps and pads along that stretch of road from the new park, uh, from the park to the new development. This is that residential sidewalk that I had talked about, which was completed by that partnership between the local contractor, the concrete company, and the church. How that worked was the contractor actually donated their time and skills to remove and install the new section of sidewalk. They found a concrete company who was willing to provide the concrete at cost and then the local church paid for the materials that were needed. So an old, I'm sure in your communities as well, you have older segments of sidewalk. This one was particularly made out of brick, making it very unsafe. Um, it was not level. There were sections that were heaving. Um, and it, so it made it unsafe for the residents in the community to, to use that section of sidewalk. The next slide here is in front of our elementary school, which houses third, fourth, and fifth grades. We were able to work with the school district to add this ramp and the ADA pad, as well as paint the crosswalk. This is a driveway that goes through um, the elementary school here, and it kind of rounds the corner. The tricky part is, is there's a residential sidewalk that comes through this area and it 
and so pedestrians were crossing in the middle of um, morning traffic. So we were able to add in that ramp, add the stop sign, which is movable, um, makes it easier for cleaning out the, uh, the driveway there when we have snow. So that's why it's not a permanent one. Um, it can be moved. And uh, so that was one of, the, one of the things. We've done several other projects with the school on their property as well. One of our newer projects, the city um, used some of the funding that was allocated for this fiscal year to add in this section of sidewalk. And this is connecting a residential development to the commercial development, which is nice. And this here is that priority one uh, area, that intersection that we converted from a two uh, converted from a two way to a four-way intersection. So now we have that section of sidewalk where pedestrians won't actually have to cross that street any longer. They can walk through here. Another thing that we did along another route uh, was add in um, cement and ADA pads and medians, making it safer for the residents to cross without having them to go out into traffic or walk across the grassy median there. The picture on the right shows this segment of sidewalk. This is all new section. The sidewalk currently went right out here. So you can see the hazard that that would pose for um, any resident within Sergeant Bluff having to cross the intersection there, land on the median, and then cross diagonal over to the existing curb cut. So what we did is remove that section. We added in this new section of sidewalk so that pedestrians would then be able to cross in front of the vehicles rather than behind them or between them. This slide shows a new pedestrian bridge that connects a new subdivision to a sports complex and a walking trail in Sergeant Bluff. This is a little sidewalk, too, that goes in between two homes. Um, they have a lot of those connectors in Sergeant Bluff trying to connect the different neighborhoods, and I'll be able to show you those in here in a minute as well. Um, in order to fund this, this was not included in that funding that they dedicated just for our sidewalk improvements to the coalition. They were able to fund this by having the developer um, pay a connection fee of about $10,000 and then the city put in additional funds from their electric funds, um, the sewer and culvert and sidewalk came from the streets uh, budget and then the rest of it came from the general city fund. There were no grants that were used to um, install this pedestrian bridge. We also were able to pass a complete streets resolution in February and our coalition now plans um, to review any new developments. Sergeant Bluff is a growing community, so we are now able to review any plans for new developments to ensure that they are going to be walkable before they are built. A couple of our next steps in addition to the priority three area that I showed you earlier is to secure funding and work with the commercial properties to put in the sidewalks um, that are shown in yellow so that we connect the businesses to the walking trail. Here's that walking trail. This is where that pedestrian bridge went in. Um, so that all the residents have easier and safe access to um, not only the businesses here, but obviously the recreational complex, and then here's the schools over in this area. This is a highway. Uh, we often see individuals walking on that highway trying to get down to the businesses or the, the community center, and so we want to make this uh, safer for residents. So that sums it up for my presentation for Sergeant Bluff. Thank you, Angela. And now I'm going to turn things over to our largest town in this set of panelists, um, Sulphur Springs, Texas. Um, actually, Mark, I'm going to let you tell us where precisely in Texas that is, because to say something's in Texas is not very specific. Uh, yeah, but with us today place. we have <laughs> with us today we have city manager. Mark Maxwell, and I'm going to let Mark tell you a bit about the changes in downtown Sulphur Springs, Texas. Good morning, everybody. Um, Sulphur Springs is, eh, we describe it to most people, as being near Dallas. It's about halfway between Dallas and Arkansas. And um, 
I, the perspective I want to give you today is uh, a little bit different. Um, it's one thing to provide people the opportunity to walk from point A to point B, whether it's on a sidewalk or a hike and bike trail or whatever, and it's another thing entirely to make them want to do it, and that's what I want to talk about today is making people want to use whatever uh, facility you're building for them. And, and I'm coming at this from a perspective of a downtown. Um, Sulphur Springs has a downtown. In fact, Sulphur Springs is uh, about 165 years old. And as many uh, old Texas cities, we found our downtown in a state of disrepair and, and dilapidation that um, would be hard to match. That's a picture of Main Street in 2007 before we began our uh, revitalization efforts. Um, now, the, here's the big point that I want to make about making people want to use your facilities, whether it's a sidewalk or um, a downtown in general, is that you need to create an emotional link between the citizen and the facility, or I would even say the city as a whole. And that sounds strange to say because we don't think of cities as being emotional things. We think of them as water lines and sewer lines and sidewalks and streets and libraries. Uh, but I read a book one time called The Art of City Making, and it made a very poignant point in the first chapter, and that is that we do need to create that emotional link. And so how do we do it? Well, we don't do it like the picture that you see there. There is nothing in the picture that makes you want to be there, whether it's the narrow sidewalks or the wide streets or the ugly utilities overhead. Here's another view of the same street. And you can tell that when the street was built, you, you, you can tell what the emphasis was. It was not on pedestrians. It was on traffic. There is enough width in that street to put five lanes, five narrow lanes, albeit, but you could fit five lanes on that street. And there's absolutely no reason to do it. And yet the sidewalks are narrow. Uh, let me show you the next slide here. So this is what we faced in 2007, a dilapidated downtown where nearly every storefront was boarded up. Our local bank, or one of the two local banks downtown, was actually in discussions among their board to leave downtown entirely and go something else, go somewhere else. And this is the only pretty part of this block of Main Street. This was kind of the beginning of um, uh, a, a local effort among shopkeepers and ho or, or building owners to do something with their buildings. But notice that they're all vacant except for the genealogical society archives that you see on the right. Everything there was vacant. And so this is what it looks like today. Now let me ask you, does it create an emotional connection? Do you want to be there in that for any reason? And I would say yes. There are people dancing in the middle of the street because this is a wedding. So think about what that says, that a young bride-to-be stands in the middle of a street and says, gee, I think I would like to be married here. So we set about redesigning our downtown to create that emotional connection. Here you see some girls dancing in the street. Now, this is physical activity. It's not what we set out to do. What we set out to do is make this a place where people wanted to be. So, um, and it's impossible to go over all of it in a few minutes, but I can tell you uh, a few things as we go along. Of course, you see in this picture some old-timey street lights, and you see a speaker on that pole. Every pole has two speakers on it, and we pipe music through all of downtown. We made our sidewalks much, much wider, and the uh, the mayor of Soap Lake talked about bulb outs on his streets. This is very, very important because a bulb out is a place where the curb suddenly kicks out and goes around something. 
And in our case, just behind the little girl is a magnolia tree, and the curb kicks out and goes around that magnolia tree out into the parking lane of the street. And it has the, in, the effect of de-emphasizing traffic, which is half of emphasizing pedestrian. You have to put your roads on a diet and make them skinnier and make your sidewalks fatter. And it also creates an emotional speed bump for, um, for people in automobiles because while the lane doesn't actually get any narrower that they're driving in, it feels narrower. They feel constrained while they drive through it. Part of creating an, an outdoor space where people want to be is, is just simply four walls and a roof. If you can have a terminating view at each end of a street somewhere, whether it's a church or a mountain or something, and here, if you look at the end of the street, the street takes a turn, and we have a natural terminating view. So we have walls on either side, and we actually have a terminating view on each end of the street. And then what do we do for the roof? And so we planted trees uh, that are actually much larger than what you see now, and they're beginning to form a canopy overhead. And then we string some lights across. And there is something about being in a space that creates a connection with people, and they just want to be there. And so when people drive to town and they drive past the street, they will make the block so that they can either drive down the street or get out of their car and walk down the street. And this has become the center of social activity in town. We have many restaurants and shops that have opened up, and people just want to be there because there is that emotional link. Here's a picture of a couple on a sofa. See the bricks under their feet? That's the middle of Main Street. This is another wedding where they've just showed up and, and, and uh, put furniture in the middle of the street. And by the way, so we, this happens all the time. We have concerts in the middle of the street. Now, here's another th thing that um, makes people want to use a facility, and that is programming. In this case, the programming is a car show, but there are other things that, that you could do as well in a park to make people want to utilize the park or, or, or any other uh, facility, really. Let me show you a picture. You can see the, the bulb out that the mayor of Soap Lake spoke about uh, on his streets, and you can see them here. Uh, but here is another attempt to create uh, an emotional connection. Now, you see nobody on the street because this is, picture is taken at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. But you see the lights on the Christmas trees. Those are actually choreographed to music. We hired a lighting professional from Las Vegas who has uh, designed a, a light show for this street and the next street over and all of our square. We actually have a four-color light show on the square itself just to create a sense of wonder and magic to be another reason that... Um, make people want to go downtown. Here is an old building before we began, and this is the after picture, and you can see the Christmas lights wrapped around the light pole there. Here is the same building from the back before we began, and here is the same building today. This is a typical Saturday night behind the restaurant called Muddy Jake's. They built a little a uh, pavilion there, just big enough for, I, I guess you'd call it a band shell, just big enough for a, a three- or four-piece band. And people gather there uh, every Friday and Saturday night in the spring, summer, and fall. And isn't that what we're trying to do? Get people off of their sofa, out of their house, and doing something? And And I would say that we have created that emotional connection in our downtown that I think we should all aspire to create. Here is a an old drugstore that was kind of the iconic drugstore back in the 50s and 60s. Here it is today as a restaurant. Now I want you to notice how narrow the sidewalks are there and this massive bulb out that we've built around the entire corner just to allow for um, sidewalk cafe dining. Uh, again, de-emphasizing traffic and uh, re-emphasizing pedestrians. Here is another street um, 
a block over called Connolly Street. Uh, notice again the width. Notice the stoplights. I don't can't imagine why we ever needed a stoplight. Here it is again today. With um, in fact, this is the day we opened it with with the, uh, the new streetscape, the narrower street, the bulb outs, and everything. Uh, I'll, I'll skip. This is the old library. We turned it into our city hall that I'm speaking to you now from. And here's a point I want to make. And this is emblematic of uh, how we all have our priorities wrong or have had for decades. This is the town square in Sulphur Springs, where it was before we started. Arguably the most valuable piece of real estate in the county, and we're using it for parking. Because after all, it's important to have happy, shiny cars, right? So we took it out. There it was again uh, from overhead. That's what it looks like today. We took out the parking and put it around the perimeter and created a space for people to gather and we, we program events. There's almost every single weekend, there's something, even in the wintertime, there's often something going on in this space. And it was interesting that when we built this space, people didn't understand what it is really we were trying to accomplish until the day that we put the grass down. And it was, it was very interesting that before we even put all of the grass down, I think we had three of those little pieces of pie down that you see in the center of the circle, that people began to use it. We had a mother and her two kids come out with a picnic basket when we're laying the sod and began using the, uh, the square for what it was intended to do because they felt it. They were drawn to it like a duck, a duck is drawn to water. That's how it's used. This is a 4th of July celebration. There's a concert on the square. It's a symphony orchestra. And this is just one of the many, many events that we have downtown. Here are just some more pictures of, uh, I think I fast-forwarded through a couple. So here's the 4th of July celebration. And here is an interactive fountain in the same square that the children get to get in and, and play in, and the water lights up and when it shoots over the lights above it, and it's sometimes choreographed to music depending on the season. And this, create, this is something that I want to mention to you. If you're creating pathways for people to, to walk on, if you can incorporate water into it somehow, if you have a stream to walk along, an ocean to walk along, a pond to walk around, there is just something about water and the human spirit that they, they are just drawn to it. Uh, and here's another celebration that we have downtown. It's just packed with people. I, I believe this was Cinco de Mayo. Um, so anyway, we, we, we set out to create an emotional connection uh, with the people, and, and I think that we've done that. Um, and, and I want to, to, to bring up one more thing, if I can, before we go. Um, it's okay to be a little silly. In fact, um, I would say that it's even a good thing. Take a look at our logo. It, it has a festive, perhaps silly feel about it. Well, um, let me show you. Do we have time? Can I show a one-minute video? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So, so here is a town in Norway, and this is their crosswalk. It's a, a silly crosswalk. If you see the sign, well, they'll, they'll show you the sign here in a minute. And, and they're just trying to get people uh, to have a sense of fun, a sense of silliness. And we actually installed these signs on one of our crosswalks downtown. And, and you can see people doing that. And I'll show you one more thing. Um, Sulphur Springs is home to glass bathrooms. And so you see a lady going in the glass bathrooms right there. You can see out, but they can't see in, or so you hope. And, <laughs> and, and people were just astonished that we would attempt to do something like this, but we did, and it worked. And people show up. They will, they will get off the freeway to come see the glass bathrooms. So whatever you do, if you're putting in a, a park horse or something, make it a little silly. Create an emotional connection, and people will show up. 
And uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. Oh, thank you, Mark. You've made me giggle here. Um, well, that's we the do point. have a number. Of, <laughs> we do have a number of questions coming in, and I think actually the, probably the one that may be foremost on people's minds. When you took away parking, and I am speaking to Mark here in downtown uh, at the square, where did people park in order to go downtown? What were their options? Oh, so uh, two things on that. One, when we took the parking out of the middle, we put it around the perimeter. We actually shrunk the square a little bit and parked around the perimeter. We actually picked up a space. Um, that's one thing to know. And two, and this is the most critical thing to know, is it's all about creating a reason to be there. If you have the reason, they'll park further away and walk. And I knew this when um, in 2008 we we won the state football championships, which is a really big deal in Texas. We had 5,000 people downtown. I have no idea where they parked, but they figured it out. They came down for the celebration. They'll, and this is just, I can't emphasize it enough. If you have a reason to be there, they'll show up. Think about this. Nobody goes to Disneyland for the parking. They go there because there's a reason to be there. Although they happen to have great parking, but think about it. If you took that, the, the parking argument to the extreme, if people show up for the parking, well, you could just eliminate all of Disneyland and make the whole thing a massive parking lot. But then again, you've taken away the reason for being there. So, And this has been one of the most difficult obstacles to overcome is this impression in people's minds, especially the merchants downtown, that it's not all about parking because they think that it is. And until you show them otherwise, it's a tough fight. Uh, but we're, we're beginning, I'm actually beginning now to hear, to hear merchants say, I'm not too worried about parking. I found that they'll find their way here if my pizza is good enough or, or whatever they're making is good enough. And in fact, that happens. That's terrific. And in fact, it answers another one of our questions that we had related to your initiatives and closing part of the downtown for some activities. Um, so I have a question for Raymond in Washington State. And uh, it has to do, I think, with the demographics. And one of the slides you showed had uh, maybe three languages for your materials. Or am I getting that wrong? Please, can you comment on the demographics or what languages you were translating things to? Yes, we have a large Ukrainian Slavic population, so it was put in, uh, one survey was in Russian, and we have a large Hispanic population, so it was also in Spanish and then, of course, English. That's terrific, and your, your population of your town this year, do you know, is it still around 1,500? It's about 15, 1,574. We're, we're having a growth we have more construction going on in our community of housing construction than in the past five years combined. So you're approaching 1,600 people there. Um, and then over in Iowa, yeah. uh, Angela, when I spoke with you first, um, I'm remembering a story about the collective uh, efforts that you mentioned in your presentation regarding the concrete pouring and how the church got together and I'm believing that different people pay for different aspects of that. Can you comment on the uh, how people uh, found the money to pay for it? Um, yeah, our we have a, a local, we have one of our local larger churches actually, which is in Sioux City, that does outreach and community service projects during a, a week during the summer every year. One of the individuals that had seen the results of our walkability audit with the pictures of that resident um, residential sidewalk goes to that church. She actually knows pretty well the contractor, so she made the connection. <laughs> she made the connection with the being able to get the church and the contractor together. Then the contractor reached out to the local concrete company because they do work with them um, to see if they could all come together to be able to to make that sidewalk improvement. Um, it, it was an individual, the reason why they chose that particular sidewalk obviously is be, because of the, the trip hazards, but the individual that lived there was not able to uh, make those improvements themselves for financial reasons. They also struggled just with 
paying basic bills. And so um, that all got brought up and discussed in one of our coalition meetings, and that's how that all kind of came together. Terrific. And I think this question could be for anyone. Uh, it has to do with accessibility issues for people with disabilities or mobility limitations. And have you found any feedback on the changes that you made or even during the process that helped with some of those issues? This is Raymond. Go ahead, Raymond. We have a council member who is uh, disabled, uses a wheelchair, and she provided excellent input from a disabled person's um, uh, perspective on uh, during our design process. So that's a very valuable contribution to have if you have somebody who actually has some type of of a disability that that uh, that they can give their their personal input. I'd like to add to that if I could. This is Mark. Sure, Mark. Mm -hmm. On our uh, portion of the project that was the downtown square or the plaza, as we call it, we actually did away with curbs altogether, so that the surface of the street is at the is on the same plane as the sidewalk itself. And so we eliminated uh, architectural barriers all around the square, and then we get the added benefit of, they actually call these festival streets, so that um, your, your event, your festival, can be in the plaza, on the sidewalk, in the street, all at the same time, it's like one playing field, so to speak, and, and people have loved that. Fabulous. Um, and I think, Mark, we got a question about how you got your efforts funded. Um, and I'm, I'd like to sort of paint a picture of the different types of funding that you all have available to you in uh, cities of your size. And so before you answer that, Mark, I just wanted to um, mention um, that, for instance, in the Iowa example, um, that 10 years ago the, the city was acquiescing or was saying yes to developers um, not having to put in sidewalks and then the city was asked by those residents to put that in. Angela, I'm telling a story for you. Um, and found that it cost them $200,000 and suddenly they said, okay, yes, we will have the developers put it in. Um, but I know that that was one method of getting some funding and um, I'm going to ask both Raymond and Mark to comment on some other methods. So uh, a really big uh, tool for cities when it comes to doing projects like this is called tax increment reinvestment zones. And so basically what you do is you, you, you draw a line around a, an area on a map and you say this is, this is our reinvestment zone. And so ours was downtown and we found that it had a taxable value of $13 million. And so we, we set a cap at 13 million and then we we sold bonds to fund the improvements and then all of the improvements that go into that area what happens is the value of the properties in that area all go up and because the value of the property goes up they produce a greater income stream and then that income stream is captured and set in a separate fund and used to pay the debt service on the bonds that we sold. And, and I believe every state in the union has some form of tax increment reinvestment zones available to them. And, and that was probably 75% of our project. The other 25% was a combination of current revenues in the general fund and uh, grants. We got a few grants from the Community De Development Block Grant Program for sidewalks. And then Raymond, if you would answer that question, I have another one for you right afterwards. Okay, we, we about had uh, this, one was a, this one was about funding. Our, <laughs> yes. Yeah, our primary a primary uh, funder for the downtown was the Transportation Improvement Board. Uh, they were about one point uh, eight million dollars uh, for the eighteen hundred feet of uh, street sidewalk and uh, lighting improvements. Then there was the, let's see, we had the TIB, then, then the USDA gave us uh, the 685000 for the new sewer lines. 
Uh, then there was the economic local Grant County Economic Development Grant uh, uh, Council that had a strategic improvement program grant that helped us with the matching funds. There was a match on the TIB that we couldn't didn't have the funds for, so they helped us uh, with the match. And then there were several private foundations and uh, local organizations that contributed small amounts for the uh, uh, aesthetic improvements. Terrific. And a follow-up question that I think is uh, not quite funding, but I know that you um, had something to say about this, Raymond, was about the importance or at least how the timing of getting community input. Could you talk about uh, what process along the way um, was it most critical to talk with community members and how that was incorporated? Well, there, there was the downtown plan that was developed in 2005 uh, with the assistance of a state state grant and they had somebody from the Commerce Department that was that was organizing the community for input. It was a very exhaustive process uh, and, and you know probably took uh, almost two years. Uh, lots of input from the citizens, beautiful downtown plan and then uh, that administration put it on a nice clean shelf and it sat there until I took office in 2012. The number one thing that the community told me that they wanted was to implement the downtown master plan. So we took it off the shelf, we updated it, and then we went after all uh, all the funding that uh, that I mentioned. Does that answer the question on the process? I think so. Um, I think there was also a question about where the input was the most important from the citizens at the beginning oh, or besides. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, there was, of course, that critical input at the very beginning uh, that, that got the excitement going for the downtown plan in 2005, and then it, then everything was put on the shelf and, and forgotten, so to speak, not by the citizens that participated and wanted it. So the the first uh, after we updated the details of the plan, we brought in the Washington State University, who has a rural community design initiative team. They sent two professors and five interns to our community, uh, five hour drive, uh, to our community to hold the charrettes. In our little town, there would be 30 to 35 people show up, which is a pretty good turnout to participate in these charrettes in learning what a downtown redevelopment looks like, what are the tools, and then they would go from there in designing, uh, putting their wish list together uh, of what they would like in a downtown, and then the engineers would, would incorporate that into the final design work. Terrific. If I can add to Angela. That. Sure. The, uh, the charrette process that the mayor used is a fantastic process. It's uh, it's done over three or four days, and it, there's a lot of um, involvement from the public. And, and if there's anything that I learned through our press process is that the earlier that happens, the better. You don't want them to feel yes. like, here's the design, now we're going to make you like it. Um, it, it when in a charrette, they come to the table, and they see their ideas being drawn on the paper while they're talking about them. And, and it may not be exactly what they wanted, but they walk out of there with a sense of ownership of the project, and you cannot replace that. Fabulous. Um, Angela, yes, you mentioned the coalition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk with Angela in Iowa for a moment and say um, you mentioned the coalition that worked with you included you know, various um, officers of the city, such as police and school districts and such planning organizations and your health department and others. Um, were there any particular sectors represented on the coalition that either surprised you or showed you um, what this cross-sectoral collaboration could demonstrate? I, I think, I think a, a good di diversity of individuals who have a passion and an interest in it is extremely important. Um, our elementary school principal is a big proponent for walkability and bikeability for the kids at the elementary school. So, I mean, she obviously was wonderful. We do have um, a Safe Kids program here in Woodbury County, so having that individual um, involved, obviously, from that standpoint is great because we're able to partner with them to do things like uh, bring in a, 
a, a truck, a, a UPS delivery truck, and bring the kids out and show them that if you stand, you know, right in front or even a few feet out, you still the driver still can't see you. Um, and we also brought in a school bus. Obviously the city and having support from a city council member, um, sometimes involving, and I found this by, because we're doing similar projects in other towns in our county as well, um, sometimes it's difficult to get city council members involved um, due to timing or what, you know, whatever it may be. But having that individual from the council on our coalition um, was very prudent because they would be able to take back the information. It's not just coming from city staff um, and speak with our other council members uh, about the project and what we've accomplished and what we really see um, as a vision for the future. Fabulous. Um, I want to give Mark and then Raymond an opportunity to uh, say any closing words. Who's first? I'll mark. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Listen, I you know I I I think I've uh, beat a dead horse here again and again. It's it's really all about creating that emotional connection. Create the sense of magic, the sense of wonder, the silliness. Don't just build something for them. Build something for them that they'll love. Fabulous. And Raymond. Mark, I'm an admirer. You've done an outstanding job, uh, and I want to come down to Sulphur Springs and and uh, meet you guys and sit and, and get get involved with what you're doing. <laughs> come on down. I'd love to take you to lunch. I'd also like to say there that I've told go. lots and go. lots of people. About, I've told lots of people about those glass enclosed restrooms, and they all look at me in in horror <laughs> and disbelief. <laughs> but they use them. So. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to thank all three of you, Angela, Mark, and Raymond, today for talking about your towns of Sergeant Bluff, Iowa, Sulphur Springs, Texas, and Soap Lake, Washington, and invite everyone to visit our website at physicalactivitysociety.org for write-ups on those cities and some others of small towns stories, and also to look for a copy of this webinar and presentations later this week. Thank you for joining our webinar. This concludes our presentations for today. Bye-bye. Thank you.